guys, it's Michelle Taylor Willis, and thanks again for tuning in to According. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor. Willis. It's Michelle Taylor Willis. Back at you. You're watching According to Michelle. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor Willis with another episode of According to Michelle. And of course, I find my favorite place, at least my favorite place for like, I don't know, the next week or two. The Anguished Barber in Midtown Atlanta. And I love this place because I can send my guy here and he can get like an awesome shave up. I don't know if that's what they call it, shave up or right, right. But he can get his beard trimmed, he can get his hair cut, and he can go right on the other side of the doors, which you can't see, sorry. He can get a fantastic craft drink. I mean, so good. So you gotta come and visit David, all my friends at the English Barber. But enough about that, because speaking of craft, I have no idea where I'm going with this connection. But So I've been married for 10 years, so we married in the same year. So you knew, you didn't feel like it was, this is it? No, I did not. So let me tell you about him. He was a talker too. And Which was, means he's still a talker. He's still a talker. We have great conversations. <laughs> but he wasn't aggressive enough for me. He was a good dude. Yeah, because you're yeah, a very like outspoken It takes a special kind of man all the time. And he was so nice and everything. Okay. He was not aggressive enough. Oh, the conversation was nice, the dinner was really cool and everything. He was really We're talking about dinner. Girl. We met at a restaurant south of Atlanta. It was just long one for lunch. Okay. And uh, I'm an early bird. So it was like five o'clock dinner? Like, no, it was like two o'clock. So I, I got there at 1.45. Oh, God, I'm so like, you show up at the right on time. <laughs> you're early on time, you're on time. You're like, Give me some space. I just wanted to know what time you were going to get here. I said, well, I'm sitting in the restaurant. Don't be trying to get here before me to check me out, because I'm going to check you <laughs> Girl, he walked in that six, six, size 16 and a half shoe. What? Girl, he six, he has a 16 and a half shoe. It's cool. The broad shoulder. He sat in front of me, and we talked for two hours. It was a wonderful conversation. But after that, Regular, everything was cool, and I, I was bored. And I called him one day, and I said, "You're really nice. I appreciate all the conversation, but you're just not for me." And aggressive enough, and it, it was nice to meet you. Goodbye. I, I, I did that, I, I, and, I, and I walked away. So how long? Something happened, and uh, he contacted me. I can't remember how long it was, and asked me, you know, hello. I said, "Hey, how are you?" He's like, "I'm doing it." I said, "Doing." Did you okay? Did you really look at him? You had no idea. Okay, but it's okay. He asked me out to dinner at his house. And I said yes. I pull up to his house. He opens the door. I smell the aroma of the food. So he can cook the roses, petals, everything. The jazz music playing. He's looking at me. He's sweating, nervous. Right then, because he's a nice guy, I knew he was nice. He did, and we've been together every day since. Are you serious? God sent me exactly who I was supposed to, and that's what He does. Yeah, that's what He does, and that's what. And so 10 years later, it's been hell and good. But that's what, but that's relationships, right? I was just talking to a friend of mine earlier today. We were talking about the fact that, you know, people have been married for 50 years and they look like they're all in love. But I mean, we don't know what people go through, right? I mean, it's just about the commitment to saying, okay, we're just going to do this no matter what. we're fake. We drive the cute cars, maybe. We pull up with a nice house. We dress to the nice and everything. Perfect. Right. And then you open that door, and you're all talking, you're not having no sex, the kids are bad as hell, and you continue to pretend that nothing is wrong with your family. 
but it's okay. It's better on the outside. I just think sometimes people want to look pretty. You know, like, just like, take a break. And, and, and sometimes it, your head will give you that. You know what I mean? Like, in your mind, sometimes you can say, all right, I'm going to take, I just need to take a break. And like, what if this? And then you can come back to reality and say, okay, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? My what if has been, hmm, if I did that, how would that make him feel? If he did that, how would I feel? And I would not want that feeling. It's a, listen, I've been cheated on. Yeah. Have you ever been cheated on? Yes. So I know what that felt like. It's not good. Yeah. And you question like, okay, why did you do that? Why couldn't you talk to me? What is it? I didn't question about nothing I did. I was just looking at you about what you did. Right. But why did you go there? Why couldn't it be something we just talked out? So I said to myself, Treat people the really the way you want to be treated. Hey. You no know way. But I mean, you know, everybody's people. Just because you share your life with someone doesn't mean that they are comfortable. People get married for all the wrong reasons. They sure do. Right? People are. I mean, I talk to so many people who say, "I knew when I got married, it wasn't the right person." But they I knew, do. and they still did. So you know, you you have all that stuff. You take that stuff in to a marriage, and keep in mind, you're gonna change as you get. As, as you get older, as you get more engaged, as you get more engaged with this person, you get so you're going to change on now. So imagine if you take all your stuff that you never dealt with into a state, and then you're with somebody, and you continue to change, continue to evolve. And if you're not completely disappointed, as you continue to change, and as they change, yeah. so yeah. I mean, it sounds crazy to us, but I, the more I live, the more I'm around, the more people. Know, people in the spotlight, out of the spotlight, the more I realize everybody has their own level of stuff. Everybody's got their own stuff they're dealing with. Everybody's got stuff they're dealing with from other people. And if you can't, if you're not confident, you're not self-aware, and if you can't communicate, you bring somebody else into that. It's the and do we always fight to the point of finger to what they need to do? Yeah, I mean, everything. We so much that. starts with us. Right. So much starts with us. And just even saying, I apologize. I mean, can you think of the last time you told somebody, I'm sorry, I screwed up? I did that the other day. I had to tell my husband, I was sorry because I was mouthing off about something, and he's just looking at me and I was like, But think about how many people don't, they're not even comfortable to say, they'll never say, I'm sorry. They'll never admit they're wrong. They didn't have a problem. They'll know it's that in the yeah. spotlight. And so it's like they'll say all the time, you, 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 but they'll never say me, 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 me. Right? They just have to say it. And so it's not everything. Most things it's not with us. You know, I think we don't even know what to say. Think about when you're dealing with no. your sad. No. I mean, but, but, you know, there are people who need people that would never say, you know what, employee one. I messed this up, we got this. Because they're so awful. I'm in charge, I can never be on my own. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. Who else is going to be? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, like, to be able to say, I mean, at least twice a week, I've, I've got to tell one of my people. I'm sorry. Like, I screwed up. Or not even one time, it's like, you know what? You're right about that. I'm wrong. That's my bad. I think a lot of women, too, I don't know if you agree, girl, or home, but we need to know how to be submissive. Absolutely. And we don't want to do it. We want to we wanna be both the man and the woman in the relationship. And you know, I, when I was growing up, my parents, before my dad passed away, he'd been married for 46 years. Mm-hmm. When did your dad pass? My dad passed um, the year that we swore in President Barack Obama. Oh, wow. Yeah, were you were dad Oh, my God, my dad. I mean, that's where I get my name from. Yeah. Like, Sasha Medina, when I was little, I used to go in. Meters and I would mimic news radio. So you knew you wanted to do this and yeah. you were just a child. And he said, That's my Sasha. That's your name, Sasha the Gruber comes from. I'm a father. And all of me is him, right? All the spice, the humbleness, the loving, stubbornness, hustle. Um, 
that wicked world out there will tell you how terrible you are, how ugly you are. You're not going to be any wrong. I was at the bullying, uh, what, what is it the kids go through? Peer pressure? And I didn't give a damn. Y'all don't mean nothing. But that thing right there that I got to come home to, that was not, I mean, but to just to have, you know, to grow up in a family. Because so many people, especially us, we don't get that. We don't know, and especially here in Atlanta. In Atlanta, we know that, unfortunately, poverty, yes. broken homes, yes. um, lower education, that falls on my kids. It does. What do you, so let me ask you a question. Where, where does your passion lie in that? Because it, it, it sounds to me like you have, you really have a passion for people. I love it. And you really do, um, you want to help. You know, you're not just this personality, but you really want to offer yourself that too. So what are your passion projects in terms of community and helping I love children. Yeah. I love the elderly. They're so wise and beautiful. Those are the two from the bottle, right? Kids and I mean, they to figure out and love them. Right. Um, I love working with young girls who in my situation, teenage mothers, who so often feel so hopeless that because they're pregnant and they have this baby, that I can't make it out here because So those are the things that were my heart in. And when you talk about, you talk about personality, you know, being in this business, I gotta tell you something. I'm, I'm very humble. Every day I just thank God you gave me the gift to run my mouth. And the people listen. And they hang on your every word. And they want to email you. And they, they want to hug you. And they want to autograph. And they want to talk to you. They want to take a picture. To this day when it happens, I'm still in awe. Yeah. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. I never take it for, for granted because it can be taken away just like that. For some of us, we don't even have any trouble. Right? So that's how I walk my life. And, and, and the platform is cool, but we're all the same. I go to the same Yeah, we have some eyes. And they're mine. I know. My father's eyes. They're gorgeous. And you, um, did you do this on purpose? Did you put on the olive? Today, so, what you would mean? No. Okay, fine. So I'm gonna just break it down. Te molested teenage mom, divorced, another marriage. They went rocky. Kids, one's in jail. Okay. Um, health, Sasha, health issues. I've had stuff, and I don't mind you knowing my stuff, my stuff has made me strong and a better person. And helping other people too. Yeah. Had money issues, bad credit. Hey, I've been there. Okay. I have been there. Okay, had ran up the credit cards and I got a big Oh, that's for me. Oh, Is that good? Oh, I got it. Oh, I thought we were good on that. Didn't really know what a credit, credit, credit meant and credit scores. But it's a reality check of, oh my God. What happened now that I could be homeless? And so many of you want to throw your nose up at someone who's on the street that's homeless. That could be you. Absolutely. In that shelter. That's right. So, right, we need to start saving some money, girl. Listen, but you're right. I'm cheap. Girl, why don't you go to the I'm frugal. Oh, whatever. I'm frugal. No problem. Now, I used to do coupons. I tried coupons. They tried coupons. Yeah, and they had like coupons. I was, I was, I was on coupons heavy for like. So where did you get Out of the paper. Or they you know, used to print. You said they they tell me they said print magazines. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can you can get them. You can like go and print them off the. You don't have to pay for anything. Like you can go on like a website or something and print them from SundayPaper.com. So, um, yeah. But I did coupons hard, oh heavy for like. A good eight or nine months. When I left corporate America 
and we I focus solely, that's when I went 100% cold turkey and just working in my consulting company. And wow. so we cut everything. I was, I worked on coupons and I shopped at Walmart and I went to Trader Joe's. I mean, Walmart for groceries, which, you know, because I love Publix. Like, I am a heavy. I love Publix too, but some of this stuff is hot. That's why I go to Walmart. Well, so, yeah, but I mean, I did that for. Which you got to do too. I mean, you have to. Shit. Right. When I say I am thrifty, do you know what thrift stores? I believe you. Girl. I go to, um, what's the, what's the, which one? No, no, no. What's the one that? Valley Village. No, what's that? Oh my god, the Valley Village is all over Atlanta Grove. Massive stores. I've never heard about Valley Village. I go to a couple of one. There's one off of Metropolitan Parkway. There is one off Valley of. Valley Village. Uh, what's the one more Avenue. Avenue. the one more than that? The Avenue. They have a perk trainer too. Because I don't like being I don't like being full price on anything. I'm gonna take that. Right? Well now with technology and you can shop around, me neither. I don't like that. I mean on the Facebook marketplace. <laughs> I don't know if that, that's like Craigslist, right? Yeah, but on Facebook. But see, okay, let me tell you nervous about those. Because like how do you know you your husband? Know? So I will shop you in a victim of the Well you girl, I'm not going up in the wife's house, okay? If my husband and I see something, my husband takes care. Takes a little bit of a yeah, feeding people out and all that stuff is dangerous. But I just say, you know, look, you can go to the, the boutique, the best malls, and shop online, and you can be thrifty too. Absolutely. Do you know that I was invited to a luncheon to meet Michelle Obama? Did you know? What? Did you say that to her? What? Do you know? Do you have a picture of her? You got yes. to see it. I have to show you. But I want a list of all of these all stores, stores to go because, yeah, because I go to a couple of different places and I shop on, like, what's about the real? Like, I don't pay full price for a lot of stuff. I don't like to. You don't have to. It seems like it makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I just ordered some sales events off of Amazon for like $52. See, that's what I'm saying. So it's like, I can't wait for that to come. So I got my Courtney, Courtney, yes. okay. and then I'm going to have my sales events. I've got my Adidas shelter. <gasps> oh, so in the house. And I didn't take the price of savings, so you both and you have a savings account. I do have a savings account. Yeah. But I didn't always. I don't want to be broke. I didn't always. I don't, I don't, I don't, you call me lots of things broke. I don't want to be broke. And I want to want to make sure I leave some big for my shirt. So let us real quick, because I know we got to wrap up. I'm glad you did that. Let us You said I want to leave something for my shirt. My son's in mortuary school. He will finish next year. Where, where's your son? Is he born or you're in DC or Georgia? He finishes next year and he wants to own his own year. And he will. Because of what he wants My daughter's going on to be a dentist. She wants a home apartment. We will go over to Absolutely. My son plays football for Alabama. Oh, so he's an athlete. It's okay. When my son gets out, Jail, whatever his dream is, based on what they are doing that he could get involved in or create, we need to help our children create a message to the right. But they need to be about business now. Right? They still have to be about business and money. And how much money are you saving for me to be your partner to make it happen? It's not all me getting I'm not giving that yet. I got to invest. That's right, but you got to save some money. You got to have some good credit. That's, that's when I want to, when I close my eyes, be the word of the music. That's an old song, gospel song. And my children be okay. And I can be peaceful. Why is that this is so important? Why is this so I think that's just now starting to happen when we're talking about 
Well, first of all, legacy is so important to me because we traditionally, as Latins, haven't always been able to write our own stories. We haven't been able to control our own narratives. We haven't had the opportunity to do legacy as one. And when we have, we haven't done so. I'm speaking generally, obviously. You know, some of you did a great job of doing like, leaving legacy just left us, right? Um, but on the whole, we haven't done that. But I feel like, we, we all have a purpose on this earth. And if you can find a way to figure out what the purpose of this is, and you can make money from it, and you can use that money to empower whoever needs it, so that they can empower whoever might need it. So it's this domino effect. And the legacy will happen automatically because once you lay down, close your eyes, and don't wake up again, Sasha would be able to still be rumbling around the earth. Yeah. And it's important because whatever you did that was important, whatever I did that was important, has to be loved so that other people can use those things yeah. to continue to be important and make other people. That's significance, right? That's empowering people to empower. Yeah. If we take everything with us, how is well, it well, how is it how is the how is the next generation do that? They can't. The only way the next generation can step is if we leave our pearls, our knowledge, our influence, our impact for them to be done, for the ones who want it. For the ones who want it, sometimes we've got to make it. Right? Some kind of opportunity. Because sometimes people can't see in themselves what we can see. But you can't force them. That's true. But for the ones who want it and they're willing to work with you and listen and grow, I'm willing to give it. To give all of you to all of you. But if you're not there to receive it, okay. Yeah, and, and, and you and you know, I say you gotta be if you meet me halfway, I'll meet you there when we're wrong. But I'm not meeting you at the front door. I don't have that kind of time. So speaking of time, this show you got with really great to go over Tom Joyner. Yeah. You've been rolling that was last year. We snapped in twenty eighteen. That our last quarter to get ready for January 2019. Then and you are all between well. How many markets are you guys? We started off in 20, right? We're almost 30. Almost 30. More to come. And every day is changing. We go, we um edit comedian George Wilborn in January. And every day it changes and gets better and we're learning. Other. This is different because you're working with a team, right? And you're so used to doing things your way, so you gotta have those flashlights. And it's tough. I'm just telling you, yeah, it's tough. Um, when it, God has given us a platform and how humble and blessed I am. Thank you, Lord. So I'm excited and um, I'm running with it. You are. And thank you for having me on, by the way. I appreciate it. We're always supposed to support each other, right? You know, we always hear in our community about uh, sisters not supporting each other, right? I, around me, I see, I see the good and the bad. When I see the good, I want to extend myself to you. That's all I'm looking for. Right? And we should, we should do that. Absolutely. We're not going to do it. We are just going to 
Time for new leadership in the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, and Patrick Labatt is the right leader for the right office at the right time. I've created a repeat offender initiative that actually takes into account partnerships with the judges, with the DA, and, and certainly the Sheriff's Office taking the lead on really creating this ROI, if you, if you will, so that we can focus on tracking down repeat offenders who commit over 40% of the crimes. Patrick Labatt is a proven leader who will deliver the right vision for the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. He proudly served as president of the Georgia Jail Association from 2016 to 2017. He was voted as the Georgia Jail Association Jail Administrator of the Year in 2015 and 2019. It's time for new leadership in the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, and Patrick Labatt is the right leader for the right office at the right time. I'm Patrick Labatt, and I approve this message. When it comes to the best biosecurity and biosafety protocols to help your business thrive during these challenging times of face masks, viruses, and gloves, schools, businesses, sports arenas, hotels, and even churches are turning to America's top COVID-19 experts. Provaring is a solution that has the ability to change the way we fight COVID-19. Hi, I'm Socrates Garrett, Chief Operating Officer for SRS Inc. The single source solution for biosecurity protocols, SRS, will ensure that your business does not shut down. What separates SRS from other companies? We understand that if you control your environment, you control the spread of COVID-19. SRS, the one source solution. Michelle Taylor Willis, and thanks again for tuning in to According. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor. This is Michelle Taylor Willis. Back at you. You're watching According to Michelle. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor Willis with another episode of According to Michelle, the show where you learn all about Sofu, all about Lanta, so it can be all about you. So again, I am at my favorite space for this week, for this year, maybe. The Anguish Barber in uh, Midtown Atlanta with my boys, Troy and David and Will. And I've loved this spot because I can send any man here to be pampered. And while he's being pampered, he can have an amazing drink. So ladies, I'm telling you, if you want to get on your guys' good side, make sure they come here to the Anguish Barber right in Midtown Atlanta. But on top of that, on top of being at the beautiful English Barber, I have the beautiful Annie Hoffman with me today. And for those of you who do not know who Annie Hoffman is, you are completely uninformed. Because Annie wrote the book, literally. Have you written the book yet? You haven't written it. No. She needs to write a book on being in front of the camera, being behind the camera, and training people for being in front of the camera. And we're gonna learn, I don't wanna give her too much of an introduction, because you're gonna learn all about her <laughs> in the next few minutes. But, without further ado, Annie Hoffman, everybody. If Aww. I have like a pause, like on the radio show, I'll be clapping. Sound, like, oh, right. Sound effects, please. Sound effects. <laughs> so, I am so glad that I got the opportunity to have you in here today because I talk Aww. to you all the time I've known you I mean I think we met through Colleen right yes it's such an honor to be here with you it's an honor to be here with you I'm, I'm actually I did this so I could get free media training tips so. <laughs> um, but Annie is just like I mean you're a legend oh I mean, well oh. I, I don't know if I go that far you but you are a legend and you train legends I mean it's just amazing and so um I don't, like I said, I don't want to say too much because I really want to walk people through your story because I think it's just 
fantastic. So thank you. Yeah, well, you're welcome, but thank you for sure. Okay, so Ohio girl mm-hmm. turned New York girl turned Atlanta girl. How in the hell <laughs> does all that happen? Well. Um, I grew up in Ohio, of course, um, but I started working at ABC Sports and ESPN and CBS Sports when I was 18 years old. So I started traveling a lot and I started going to New York a lot and of course I fell in love with sports television. So at the time, New York City was the place to be for that. Right. So I moved there and... Um, and you did this, was, this was, I mean, you're beautiful and you're not seasoned at all, but... I'm just saying, like, you you kind of, you, you paved the way for a lot of these female sportscasters and female um, um, sports commentators that are in the industry now, because you were doing this way back, right? You were 18 yes. when you got into this industry, and, like, you were a pioneer. Well, it's so funny, because back then, I can remember looking around at all the people working on a sports TV show, thinking, there's only about two of us women here. Yeah. <laughs> So I always felt a little pressure to make sure that, you know, I did well so that the other woman coming up behind me would have a lot of opportunities as well. Right. So already, even then, you were thinking of the next generation. Absolutely. Which is awesome. Women helping women, women women reaching back, right? That's awesome. Yeah. And the other thing that was so great about it was I did feel like, you know, we kind of stuck together and I felt like... um, that is so great because I have an incredible amount of uh, friends that I started out with, and um, we've managed to like try to help each other, and I'm so proud of them. A lot of them have gone on to do amazing things, and it makes me so proud now when I can look at all these women in sports television, hosting shows, re- you know, reporting on shows, um, people that are executive producers, people that are executive vice presidents, you know, people running networks. I've had friends who've run some of the uh, sports networks, like Lydia Steffens at Pac-12 Network. And wow. So you got into this industry when you were 18. How did you land there at 18? I know somebody uh, was looking out for you when you were <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what was a big, um, influence on me. When I was young, a lot of times we'd go on vacation to visit my aunt and uncle. My uncle happened to be an NFL coach. So a lot of times we'd go to training camp. So at the time, I don't think I realized what a big influence that was, but I would have a lot of conversations with him about goal setting. I was always a pretty young and ambitious girl. I can't imagine that. (laughs) I always said I was a very strange girl. I was reading Think and Grow Rich in middle school and high school. Um, and I was fascinated about, uh, I was also really fascinated about law of attraction. Oh. And so I remember writing my goals down. I mean, people that I went to high school with would tell you this. They thought it was so funny. And I would put them on a big five by seven card and I would say them over and over. Mm-hmm. And then I started to visualize <clears throat> myself working at a TV network. Now, at the time, I had absolutely no contacts at a TV network. Um, I, I didn't really want to bother my uncle at the time. Uh, so I thought, how am I going to do this? I said, somehow it's going to happen. So lo and behold, I started uh, going to women in communications at 18 years old. I'd go to their events. I'd crash their events. <laughs> um, I started... Uh, this is still in Ohio? Or yes. Okay, and, um, and, I, and I started volunteering on the te- you know, telethons they did in the local television stations. And I just started you know, talking to everyone. And then I remember I saw... I was going to Cleveland State University. I was putting myself through college. And I saw that a girl from Cleveland State had interned at ABC Sports. And she hosted the local uh, TV magazine show that they used to have on all the time back then. And I uh, called her and said, can I have lunch with you or coffee? And she said, absolutely. And we talked and I said, you know, I'd really love to um, intern or do something at ABC Sports. Because I saw that she had interned at ABC Sports. Now the other ironic thing was, ABC Sports was coming to Cleveland State University. And one of my many jobs was a tour guide at Cleveland State University. And on my tour, I would always talk about how ABC Sports was coming to cover the NCAA Swimming Championships. Now, that was the one and only time they ever came to Cleveland State University. (laughs) And that just happened to be when I was a freshman. And you know it just didn't happen. Yeah, it It was like... Everything was working. Exactly. Because I'm such a believer in manifestation and law of attraction. So what was so magical about it was here I... I had that in my head. I saw that she interned at ABC Sports. I asked her about it. She said, oh, matter of fact, I'll, I'll connect you with a producer. 
And then I called the producer. Now, there's another little magical thing that happened. ABC Sports happened to be coming to Ohio to cover a bowling tournament. Wow. And they said, you can work this weekend. And we'll pay you $35, because I didn't even expect to get paid. Right. <laughs> and I think it was like $35 or something silly. And so I started working on that. And then I kind of quickly figured out, I'm just going to have to work really, really hard. Because mm -hmm. I was working with some really impressive young people. And I said, I'm just going to work really, really hard and just have to outwork everyone. Right. And um, I, that led to more and more opportunities. They would say, why don't you come work in the Kentucky Derby? And this is how much I wanted it, Michelle. I took, this is so funny, <laughs> I took a Greyhound bus to work at the Kentucky Derby. Wow. And I think they probably were like, this poor girl, she takes a Greyhound bus to work on events. <laughs> then we gotta make it happen for her. I mean, she's just but it goes to show you when you wanna do something right. bad yeah, enough. Work, right? Yes. Everybody thinks this stuff happens overnight and that, you know, they just wake up and see you one day. But this is like years and years worth of like working for free yes. right? and just giving your time and volunteering at telethons or whatever yes. to realize the dream. And not only that, I started interning, even though I was doing a lot of work for ABC Sports and then ESPN and CBS Sports, I uh, decided that I also wanted to make sure that I was definitely in the right direction. So I also started interning, like at the local radio station, um, in the newsroom, in the local TV station, and promotions. A lot of times I'd end up, they'd end up offering me a job, but I would always say, no, 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 I want to keep just getting as many experiences as possible. That's so smart, though, Annie. Well, I, I um, would like to think that uh, <laughs> I had a, I, that was smart, but I, to be honest with you, I just kind of felt, I do also actually, to be honest with you, I do tell college kids this, this is the perfect opportunity to have as many experiences right. as possible. Right. Because obviously when you graduate, you can't be just hopping around. It does not look good on a resume. Right. But while you're still trying to figure it out in school, it makes sense. That's yes. Probably, that's really smart. The other thing, Michelle, it really helps, and I always tell young people this, it helps with my contacts. Because, um, and like you, I love people. So to me, it was always fun meeting everyone. And then I love learning about their jobs. Right. And a lot of times I would offer to drive the executive back to the hotel or, or I'd pick up someone at the That's airport right. because you're having time to kind of get to know them, right. ask some questions. You know, sometimes they didn't want to talk that much, but sometimes they did. Yeah. And yeah. one of the best pieces of advice I got from Don Olmeyer, used to be uh, president of NBC Sports and NBC Entertainment. And when I was in college, he said, Annie, I know you're probably really tired. You probably worked about 12 hours. But when you're done dropping me off, go back to the TV truck and go sit in the audio booth. Go sit in the tape room. He said, you want to learn about every area. Right. And of course, I'm not an expert in audio or an expert in, but I have an no, idea. I, I have an idea. Right. And as a matter of fact, when I used to do on air for a little bit, they used to tease me because they said, you're so funny. You know a little bit about everything. Right. Right. <laughs> but it does help you a lot because you're going to get in situations um, where the satellite has a problem or, and, you know, you could help understand what the problem is and have a gauge how to, you know, right. fix that problem. Right. It's so funny you mentioned that because, like, on the radio show, um, I have a co-host in there, right? And, the, and the, the producer and owner of the station would always run the board and load my commercials. And so I never really did any of that until COVID hit. When mm. COVID hit, I, uh, we started zooming people in, right? And I had to use my computer, which meant I had to learn how to basically DJ. So I had to learn how to run my song. <laughs> And so I think by the end, you know, now, but we're not. You'll be fun I, at parties. Exactly, know, but it's because I'm like, why am I doing all this? But now I can pretty much produce my own radio show, right? Like, which is so great. Which is crazy because the whole time I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have to do this. I'm like, these things. Why can't you do this? You know, but I had to run everything from one computer. Yeah. And so, but to your point, it's like at least now I know how to do it. Now I know about timing. Now I know when I need to load and how long the songs need to run, and, which six months ago I had no idea and I didn't care to know, right? But to your point, it's all of these little experiences that give you context so that when you're in the situation, you kind of know. Right? Well, you know and to be, yes, and to be honest with you, when I media train athletes who are transitioning to broadcasting or sports broadcasters or even executives uh, who are doing a lot of TV, yeah. I always tell them, Try to go sit in a TV truck, go sit in a TV studio, go sit in the control room, 
because you'll have a better understanding why the producer is telling you this, this, this. Because a lot of times I don't have time to explain everything. Right. But it gives you, I, I really do think it'll make you better on air. Right. And um, I really do think it's funny. The way I train people is to try to teach them about all these little areas as much as possible so that they can take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that I said, no matter what happens, you're going to get on the air and do a great job. Right. Because you're going to understand, you know, if someone doesn't tell you to rehearse the open, you need to work with your play-by-play -play person and rehearse the open. Right. And I said, I want you to be able to go and do a great show no matter what happens. <laughs> and take care of yourself and know the questions to ask. Because I always felt like the best broadcasters I worked with at ABC Sports or ESPN, CBS Sports, NBC Sports, etc., I felt like they could produce a show. Right. I said, if our producer something happened, God forbid, We'd be yeah, fine. Like, right. And they also understood how important everyone was to the show. And they respected everyone. And that's another thing I'm very big on and when I train people. Because I work with some pretty, you know, very successful athletes. And I always tell them, you have to understand, they're not necessarily going to come up to you because you're the star. Right. So, but I want you to feel comfortable to go talk to the camera pin, introduce yourself to them. Introduce yourself to the associate director, the associate producer, the researcher. And I said, and ex talk to them if there's things that would make you know, a difference and help you. But everyone is important to the show. And I do feel like the best announcers really understood that and respected that. The full circle, yeah. Yes. So let me ask you this, because so you go from, let me back up a little bit. So um, you know, now you're in sports broadcasting, and mm -hmm. you have the opportunity at a very young age to interview and be in the space with some amazing people, right? We were talking off camera a little bit about Arthur Ashe. Oh. I mean, <laughs> you know, 99% of Americans have never even, you know, would even have thought to have a conversation, right? Or to be in the same space as Arthur Ashe. And here you were at, how old were you when you interviewed? Oh gosh, him? early 20s. Early 20s. Yeah, maybe 22, one of the most 23. Famous athletes in the world. So what would, what gave you the confidence to say, I can do this? Well, you know what? I've had this funny, funny thing about me that I've never felt like anyone is different. I felt like we all have our challenges because when I was really, really young, I'd always read a lot of biographies mm -hmm. about famous people or successful people. And you realize everyone has their own challenges. Mm -hmm. I certainly have had mine in my own background, in my childhood, um, even as my, an adult. And so I don't think of anyone as different. Right. And I feel like everyone has gifts. And I think when they share the challenges they've had and how they could help people. So like Arthur Ashe, what an inspiring person. Mm -hmm. And I was just thought, gosh, if I could just get him, because I want him to be able to share that. And this is another little funny thing. And um, I've always had this feeling that people know why kind of God put them on this, Definitely. you know, gave him this special gift. I've always had this feeling. And it's funny because one time I had a little bit of extra time. I was media training the top 12 WNBA draft picks. And when they all came in to work on camera, I asked every one of them why they think God gave them this incredible gift. Because when it comes to the WNBA, some of those women didn't even start playing to high school. And I said, you're one of the best in the country now. Wow. <laughs> And so I was fascinated. Which is crazy because a lot of these athletes started, you know, five, six. Yes. Five. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually a good lesson for their parents, you know. <laughs> like, we don't really have to start our kids necessarily. Yeah. Don't tear them down. Yeah. Three, friends. <laughs> they can start later. If okay. it's their journey, it's their journey. It's going to happen, <laughs> right. in my opinion. But it was interesting because every one of them had an answer with almost like missing a beat. And the answers were all so different. So even when I used to interview a lot of celebrities or athletes, I would, uh, or celebrity athletes, I should say, I would always, this is kind of a funny thing, but I would always kind of pray beforehand, mm -hmm. and I'd always say, please let me bring out the best in them, mm -hmm. and let me bring out something in them that they could share right. with the viewer that maybe someone in the audience needs to hear. Absolutely. So I always felt like it was something like deeper for me. And because I just see them and see like these beautiful souls who God gave them these amazing gifts. Right. And I want them to share that with people. And even people. at a young age, you were able to really kind of understand that and tap into it, not just for yourself, but for other people. And so you really are able to, to see that in your work on camera, but then in the people with whom you were engaging on camera and then 
of course, when you move to media training. So let me ask you this. So you're sports broadcasting, you're interviewing, you're on air, you're learning all these different things. When did your big break happen, so to speak? When did you feel like, hmm. okay, this is it? You know what's so funny? I don't know if I ever even felt that. <laughs> I have felt so lucky to do everything I've done. I worked on films for a while, and I love that. I, I was kind of a kid in a candy shop, and I did casting on the movie Babe Ruth. I did location scouting on a film called Noises Off, which actually didn't do well. <laughs> but I got to meet Steven Spielberg's producer, who was brilliant, and I got to travel around in a van with him. And That's crazy. So you went, I mean, again, so many pieces of this entertainment. Mm -hmm. industry that you got, right? Sports broadcasting, now you're, you're on camera, you're working on films, you're casting. I worked in PR, I used to do PR for race car drivers and tennis players and... So how did each of these things, it, was it just the connections you made? How did you yes. transition? So somebody saw you somewhere, said, hey, look, could you come and do this? And then you went, of course I can, because I'm gonna bring out your beautiful soul, right? Yeah. And then you transition, and then someone sees you and says... I, I think I've loved... I love our business so much, and I love so many aspects of our business. Mm -hmm. And to me, I always wanted to be someone that really understood a lot of different areas of our business. Right. And plus, no I, and plus I wanted one... For me, I wanted one of those careers where I got to... I didn't want to, you know, I remember when I was working in PR, they were saying, oh, you know, we're grooming you to, you know, be a vice president, you're going to be on that track. And I said, oh, gosh, I have to leave. <laughs> Why did you say that? Because I really didn't want that type of career. I wanted to go work in production. I wanted to work in entertainment. I wanted to try on air. I uh, love radio. I was executive producer. I was actually the first female executive producer of a sports radio station. And first I, female producer of a sports radio. And I thought that was super fun. That is, and it's super cool. It was Again, so fun. <laughs> trailblazing, right? Literally, the first. And to be honest with you, I just, I loved it. And radio, that experience has helped me a lot with what I do. And um, I actually encourage a lot of my clients to always work in radio, because radio, as you know, because you're, you're doing a show, is a different skill than, right. it really than what you use in TV. It really is. But actually, when you do radio, you're going to be better in TV I because you so. learn how to fill. Right. And, and, and you're, it really for, forces your brain, your left side and your right side of your brain, to really work at the same time. Right? It's crazy. You wouldn't even think that, but... You know, it takes multitasking. To yes, it does, and it's it's such a. I'm so, I'm so glad that you're doing those areas, because it really will make you just all around. It just makes you better and better. And it's like, to be honest, with you even my uh, PR experience helps me a lot. How so? Because I understand um, the pitching. Mm -hmm. I understand how to sell things. What um, and plus, because since I've worked in media, I understand what they're looking for. Right. And a lot of times I try to help my clients get experiences, doing interviews, um, and I, I just know how to like tell them, sell them to a magazine even. Because right. I also wrote a column for a few years. Of course you did. <laughs> Any but, often, woman of all women. but to be honest, that was a great experience too because how'd writing, you know? and I'm not the best writer, but I forced myself to um, really just um, spend time and try to get better and better and better. And when you write, you're also better. I think it does help you on air, too. Well, it's all a communication. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just different forms of communication. So if you can write well, mm -hmm. theoretically, you can speak well. You can speak well. If you can find a way to get those thoughts on paper. You know, it's a cir it's yes. circular, right? Um, but I think what happens a lot of times is that we kind of get lost in our thoughts, right? We have so many thoughts, especially yes. creatives. Not that I'm not creative, necessarily. But, you know, we get so many thoughts in our head and then we can't figure out how to get them out. And so sometimes we get them better out on paper, sometimes we get them better out speaking, but when you can really figure out how to get, get them out in several mediums effectively, it's like magic, right? Well, and the other thing is I always try to share with people, you know, I've had to really work at it. I'm ADD, I've been diagnosed ADD, and I also am a little dyslexic. Really? Yes, and I actually, the good thing is I could see it in other people. I was working with an executive's grandson who had to do a big uh, presentation at a big fundraiser. And uh, he didn't tell me, his grandfather did not tell me he was dyslexic. But I started working with him and I said, 
oh, you're dyslexic. <laughs> and I said, I, under I know because I'm dyslexic. Right. I said, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to memorize it. And then we're going to go back and put feeling into it. Gotcha. Because I knew that because I went to acting school. Right, yeah. Now see, now see how first. that even helps you that? Even That's acting right. school helped me. That's right, because you get the lines first. Yes. Just memorize the lines first, and we'll come back and insert yep. the emotion. And the... That's so smart. And I just think that this is great information for people because, you know, Nobody, everybody thinks they can get one thing down and that's it. And that there's layers and there's depth to everything, right? It's not a singular focus. It's not a singular act. It's not a singular piece. There's not a singular yeah. piece to anything. Everything has depth. And the deeper you can get into all of those pieces, the more well-rounded you are, the better you are for yourself, the better you are for your clients, your audience, whatever. I always want people to know, too, that you know, I had to work on my confidence. I was not uh, the most confident young woman. I had to work on that. How did you work on that? I really just started, I'll, I'll be honest, taking action helps a lot. Yeah. It builds confidence. I think having more experiences builds confidence and working. I know as I raise my own children, I'm big on them working mm -hmm. and having different experiences. Right. Be, um, and I think it builds character. Absolutely. And. Um, but it's something I did have to work on because I had some limiting beliefs about myself uh, that stem from childhood. And I mean, we all have our challenges. I notice this with everyone I've actually gotten to work with. I, but the only reason why I could pick it out in them is because I had to do it myself. And what a way, kudos to you for being self-aware. Because what happens is that we, we don't always, you know, we, don't, we recognize it in ourselves, but we won't acknowledge it. Oh, yes. Right? And so the acknowledgement piece for you is what's really been able to make you better. Oh, thank right? you. Yeah. And I, I do believe the fact that I'm a little dyslexic and it wasn't diagnosed for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, that helps me because I, I learned how to overcome and how to work around it. Mm -hmm. And even with ADD, I mean, sometimes I'm a little all over the place. But it works for me, too, because my brain goes fast and I come up with a lot of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, it's a curse, but it's also a blessing. Right. That's just maybe a little challenge, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't reach your goals. We'll just learn how to work around it. And that optimism is great. I mean, because that's what, that's what keeps you going, for sure, a positive mental attitude, right? The PMA, and then helping you instill that in others, too. And that's what, and, and so as we wrap up, I want to I wanna circle, well, I want to end the circle here because now, you media train, right? That's all you do. And I tell people, I don't know, I make up statistics all the time, but I tell people, I'm like, 80% of the people you see on TV, any media train. Oh. <laughs> okay, you definitely made that one yeah, up. Yeah, I made it up. <laughs> so, and I, you know, I'm exaggerating. But, but, but thank you. So many, you know, so many of the people that we see on camera, you have, you've touched. How did you go from saying, okay, I'm done with this piece now, it's time for me to really hone in and help make on-air personalities the best they can be. Well, I felt like when I was coming up, they used to groom on-air talent mm -hmm. more so. Now, because just the nature of the business, people are doing the job of about three people. Right. They just don't have the time. Right. So I would see a lot of people struggle. And I thought, if I could use all my different areas of background, which actually is really, I think, what helps me you know, do well in my job now. Right. Because I do understand all those different areas. Right. And so I thought, gosh, if I could just also, and also to be, it was a tribute to the people who stopped and took time to teach me the right way to right. do things. Because I really was blessed to be around crazy smart, talented people at a very young age who would tell me, you know, they were hard on me, but they taught me the right way to do things, right. I felt. So <clears throat> that's why I wanted to give back and help others who are coming up into our industry. And, um, and it makes me so happy and gives me so much joy when I see their personality shining and they're having fun and they're sharing their passion, whether it's a sport or whether it's a business. I mean, I'll be honest, I sometimes want to cry <clears throat> or get tears in my eyes because I could see their beautiful soul and their spirit shining on camera or on the radio and they're enjoying it and they're having fun. And they're sharing it with viewers and listeners. When you, when you tap into somebody's passion and their purpose, and you can see it, and then they are able to monetize it, you know, can you imagine, well, you can't imagine, making money off of what you love to do, and creating legacy, 
and empowering others that can empower. Like these are all the things I believe in and stand for. So it makes my heart sing listening to you say all these things. Annie, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> it's been and so much fun. You got to come back. Thank you. you I you will. Back. And I mean, it's, a, it's an honor to know you. It's a pleasure to know you. Mm. And um, I might have to take a couple of her media training classes. With <laughs> You're doing quite well without my help. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Guys, listen. Once again, we have seen where um, purpose and passion are a thing. I mean, we have so many shining examples, and Annie is another, uh, another great one. If you can just tap into why God put you on this earth, surround yourself with people who are so much smarter than you and that can help you execute upon it, um, and, and find a way to make money doing it, the world literally will be your oyster, and then you can use that, that money, that time, that talent, those resources, to reach back and create legacy. And that's really what, according to Michelle, is all about. It really is about you. Thanks again, always, to the English Barber. I love this place. I, I think I might get my head changed just so I can experience the, actually, I'm not going to do that. I really do love this place, and the drinks are great. you got to come and check them out. As always, it's according to Michelle on the AIB TV network, Michelle Taylor-Willis on all socials, and until next time, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>